I'm delighted to welcome Derby Scott Lopes. He was actually an outfield player. Went on trial at Ipswich. Lad got injured, so I went, I'll go and goal. It's one of them where no technique, just a big kid, just throwing myself in the way. That wasn't even my year photo in year 11, <laughs> because I missed it, because I went into Lincoln to train. Yeah, we played them that year under Neil Warnock when they're not lost for like 19 games up to Christmas. And we beat them 3-1 on Sky on a Friday night and then had a Christmas do straight after. He took me and my mate to a party in his Nissan Micro and had a Neil Light in the back and obviously I thought it was unreal, mate. <laughs> get on the back. Right, okay, I want to go straight to Watford then. Uh, obviously you had a really successful period there. You moved, they bought you for 50 grand from Lincoln. This one here, that one there, that's where the linesman said it went in. Like John Eustace was the glue that held it together. Yeah. He was incredible, like, what a captain and what a guy. Like, that's why I went to Hartlepool, because I thought, like, I need to just strip this back, start again at a half decent point. Right, I, I need to talk about your international career before we okay. finish. Yeah. You knew I'd bring this up, didn't you? Yeah. Like, no, you dive out and you punch it like this. I was like, you've obviously not seen me play, mate. I ain't <laughs> doing that. What a save from Mark Howard. Being a professional goalkeeper, I definitely understand the importance of recovery for the next performance. I finally found the perfect product to help me recover. Introducing the Mito Mobile Flex from Mito Red Light. Their industry leading devices harness the power of red light therapy, emitting red low light wavelengths through the skin. This safe and effective process kickstarts natural tissue recovery and a huge range of added benefits. Whether I'm at home relaxing or whether I'm in the studio researching goalie or no goalie, Mito Mobile Flex is designed to help me recover at my ultimate convenience. Its portability is unmatched and it even comes in its own handy travel case. You can effortlessly slip it into your suitcase or your kit bag. That's what makes it so travel friendly. The Mobile Flex offers freedom and flexibility, saving you the need to find a plug with up to three hours use on one single charge. That's enough charge to get me through two 90 minute matches to help my recovery. It's an on the go solution that gives you no excuses but to aid your recovery. My favorite feature about the Mobile Flex unit is its spot treatment capabilities. Whether it's a sore knee, hand, foot or ankle after any intense matches, the device delivers targeted and immediate red light therapy exactly where you need it. The Mito Mobile Flex unit helps keep me in top form and you can trust in it too. Hit the link in the description below for your 10% saving using code FLEX10 from the Yours Mine Away podcast. Now that's a great save by Mark Howard. What is happening, everyone? Welcome back to the Yours Mine Away podcast with me, Mark Howard. Uh, today, I'm deli delighted to be joined by a very well-traveled guest, I'm going to put it as, because you're very similar to me. You're a similar age. Uh, you've played over 500 games, mate. A hell of a career. But so I'm delighted to welcome Derby Scott Loach. How you doing, mate? Yeah, good, mate. Thanks for having me on. Um, been watching all these for a while, so excited to be here. Yeah, obviously, we've been speaking for a while about you coming on and that, so I'm, I'm obviously buzzing that you come on and that. You said that you, you've listened to a few and you know the stitch-ups that were involved with the quiz. Yeah, well, hopefully. Hopefully, we've been doing a bit of revision, but I'm not sure it'll help me out. We'll, we'll see We'll see at the time. <laughs> I don't think you can revise for the quiz, No, mate. I don't either. Right, uh, obviously, you're at Derby now. Uh, you, your role's slightly changed over the last few years. You've gone from playing a lot of games in the last three or four years of your career to, to the role you've taken on at Derby. How did this all come about? Um, it kind of came through my own coaching, really. Um, there was a few kids that I was coaching, um, and they've got a couple of exceptional talents. A lad called Charlie that I coach made some wonder save, and it got back to their scout or academy guy, and he, and he called me in about um, doing some coaching. And then when I was there, they were just like, we're looking for number three. And I thought, this might be the right time to kind of do that role. Um, and obviously... Paul Cook come in at Chesterfield and just didn't fancy me to be honest, which yep. which is fine. Like I get it, it's every, every manager's opinion. So, um, and they were great with me. They didn't stand in my way. They said I was free to go. So that's how it came about, really. Yeah, obviously that transition that we both end up going through, and you are you you still we were speaking earlier, but you love training still. You still got a massive desire to to keep the ball out the net. Yeah, is, have you found it a, a hard transition, or is it a good step in the right direction for you? I found it a lot easier mentally than I thought I would. I thought I'd miss the games and miss the Saturday afternoons, but I think because the environment I'm in, the goalies I'm working with and, and the players that you're training with and stuff like that, and obviously going to Pride Park every weekend and stuff, I think that kind of has overshadowed the thought process of not playing. Yep. So really, really taken to it. Um, so long may it continue. I've really enjoyed it. I feel better in myself. Uh, I feel as fit as I ever d ever probably have done. Yep. Probably not as agile, but you know, I feel like I can can turn up for training every day. I very rarely miss training. So 
and really, really enjoying it. I'm the same. Like, I don't miss a lot of days training unless I get given an extra day off. Uh, but I think it's, as you get older, you know your body more and yeah. you know how to look after yourself more, whether it's one day in training, you, you come off doing a lot of diving or your days off, you're like, no, I've got to be ready for Thursday or Friday just in case. Yeah, I think um, obviously your situation would be different than mine because you've still got to prepare. Obviously, I'll still prepare because you never know what can happen. But I feel like as long as I'm training, I feel better. Yeah. So like, I think if I have two days off, it's fine. But you know, when the manager drops in, oh, it's international weight, you've got three or four days off. Honestly, I have to keep ticking over, mate. Otherwise, I come in and I'm, I'm terrible. So yeah. I feel like the more I do, the, the better I feel, if that makes sense. Yep. And then your coaching school, uh, I want to get onto that. And obviously, you've built it up yourself uh, and you've got a, a lot of kids that come down and stuff. What what made you think this is the path I'm going to go down? It was lockdown, really. Um, you know, I, I love my coffee and, and all that. And I was always to my miss, I'm going to have a coffee shop when I finish and all this and all that. And then I just thought, you know what, I'm going to just offer to coach a few kids and started out with a couple of poles on the park and just to see what the interest was. And it just seemed to grow and grow. And then, like I said, a, a few of the academy boys started getting in touch from various clubs. And then I thought, I really like this. And what I really liked about it is what I could offer on the mental side of it and the experience side of it. Because I could just say, you know you know when you're training and, and kids get upset if yeah. one goes in and I'm like, well, try doing it in front of 30,000 people, throwing at that one. And then I felt I could be a bit of a mentor as well. Yep. So it just grew and grew. and. Um, so yeah, just try to put all my energy into that. And the biggest thing for me is I'm trying to give them the opportunity that I kind of had as a kid. Yeah. Because I don't think there's enough of it about anymore. No, and your coaching's very hands-on as well. You told me earlier that you join in nearly every session and you make sure that you're on the pitch with them so they know that when they turn up to one of your training sessions, you're involved. Yeah, well, I think, and we'll touch on it later, I guess, when we talk about my goalkeeping heroes, but I got to see a few in the flesh when I was a kid. Uh, and if I can join in with goalie balls or if I can say look, this is how I want it done, they see me do it at full pace, yep. then I think it just adds that little bit extra and they kind of get that experience of training with a pro as well, as well as just hearing my voice every week. Yep, that's the same for all pros up and down the country. The older ones always show you the way in training. And when you get a new young lad come through the academy and join in, you're always like, you need to do that quicker. You need to up your tempo. This is the quality. This is the service that you need. So for you to be able to show the kids that already, it, it gives them great belief going forward. Yeah, and I think... Just touching on the service there, I think that's massive, especially the way the game's played now and everyone wants you to play and and stuff like that. Um, I try and always tell the kids, like, whatever you're doing in this set, whether you're serving or, or you stood there, try and recreate a scenario where the goal's behind you. Like, you, you could be playing to your centre-half or drilling it into your midfielder. Yeah. And So I try and make sure they understand every part of the game and the position, as well as just doing that drill, whether it's like, whether you're just going onto an angled shot, if you're serving, imagine you are striking it to your full-back. Yeah. So you, you kind of get everything in that one session, if that no, makes exactly. sense. I'm a bas massive believer as well that service makes a practice or it kills a practice. Yeah. The amount of kids that can't half volley the ball anymore. I know, well, the amount of goalies that I'm <laughs> sure, I don't know if Joe, but, well, I won't say anything, but we, we've had a few where, you, you know, where you do like two or three saves in one set and, you, and you're like, yeah, I'm on it, I'm on it. Get to the last one, they just bend it past you. And you're like... <sighs> Demoralising. So, yeah. Or a finger breaker comes. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to get behind this one. Yeah, so... That's why I think service definitely makes the session a lot better. Right, okay. Let's do some quick fire <laughs> questions, right? Uh, so, catch or parry? Catch. Favourite colour kit? Black. It just makes you look straight. Well, <laughs> I like it. I like that. Black because it's smart, but traditional goalkeeper green, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. my favourite colour, goalkeeper green. Uh, play out from the back or kick it long? If you'd have asked me 10 years ago to kick it long, but probably because I can't reach now. But, um, I think it depends on the style of what team you're in. That's it. But I am one of them that they can't score from over the halfway line. So. Yeah, exactly. I'm at, so get it gone. 100%. Kick it away, mate. Right, favourite ever goalkeeper? Um, I love this story, goal, please. Yeah, a few people would be shocked at this, but it's actually Richard Wright. Um, like I touched on a minute ago, when I was eight and I was at Ipswich, went down to train with Malcolm Webster and he was like, we've got a guest for you, lads, and it was Richard Wright. And I was like, and he was obviously just about to get his move to Arsenal. Um, and watching him move in the flesh and... You know, he was like the next big thing at the time and the way he treated us all just stuck with me forever. And when I went back to Ipswich, he was coming in to train before I went to Man City to keep fit. And I actually got to train with him. And still then, like everyone I've played against or met, I've never been starstruck. Whereas to meet Richard Wright, it's like, he's my hero because it just reminds me of being at primary school as a kid and wearing that Ipswich shirt. Yeah, you saw him at both stages of his career. Yeah. Though. Obviously at the top when he was just get about to get his move to Arsenal and then obviously towards the latter end, have you like taken stuff that you saw from that day when you trained uh, those days that you trained with him? I just think his demeanor and stuff. 
obviously, when I was younger, I was just in awe of him. But when he came back, I just thought the standard of his training yeah. hadn't dropped. Yeah. Um, and that's what I try and kind of take into my training now when I'm working with Joe and Josh. It's like, right, if I can just be on it, and we can keep, and I can keep the standards high, and it makes them raise their standards. I think it's better for everyone in the session. So it's just total professionalism and how athletic and fit he still was to move around that goal is what I kind of took from. Yeah, I love that. Right, uh, favorite stadium you've ever played at? Um, I've got two for two different reasons. I love playing at Chelsea. Just because it, the size of it, but I think it's still quite traditional. Yeah, it is. It's quite it's an close. One, yeah. yeah, but I love I love Loftus Road, mate. Yeah, yeah, you know, because it's just so tight and compact. There's always and a good atmosphere in there as well. Yeah, and we played them that year under Neil Warnock when they'd not lost for like 19 games up to Christmas, and we beat them three one on Sky on a Friday night, and then had a Christmas do straight after. So the memories of that weekend. What was, a weekend! Yeah, like lads like Danny Graham and that in the team. So you can imagine what the what the weekend was like. But um. That whole memory of just, I think the atmosphere and both both tears behind the goal being full of Watford fans was was probably something that will stick with me. So really enjoy that ground. Yeah, right. Uh, best goalkeeper in the world right now. Um, it's got to be one of the two Brazilians. I probably would have said Courtois before his injury. Yeah, but I just think the consistency of them two and they seem to develop with the game as well, and, ah. and don't really have any faults. Yep. Okay. Imagine trying to pick between them two. I know. I know. I, th I think even. A lot of people used to say, yeah, Edison's great with his feet, but he doesn't make saves. But he seems to be making more saves and than ever now, whether that's because they're getting under more pride, I don't know. But both of them are just neck and neck and seem to just kick on together. Yeah, no, they're all very, very good. Right, head tennis or goalie wars? Oh, head tennis. Yeah? Yeah, me and Joe, mate, ultimate team. Yeah, he did well, mention that when he was on. I say ultimate fair. team, he carries me through, mate. That's all it is. I'm, <laughs> I'm just that one at the net that pops up for the head or just oh, tries to get the best my, place to be. Or tries to get my way. I'm not moving a lot. Yeah. So I'm either trying to get my body in the way of that that first one over or I'm setting Joe. He does most of the work. Nice. Right. Final one. Right. Uh, in the last minute of a game, save a penalty or score a goal? Just got, got to be score a goal, mate. I should have scored at Dover away, you know. I had a free, really? I had a free header six yards out and I fluffed it, mate. Tried to be too precise with it. Tried to flick it. Oh, headed no. it wide should have scored yeah um and i think that's the best chance i'll ever have i'll ever get but um got to be score a goal on it what would you have done if you scored where would you have peeled off oh, corner flags getting taken out <laughs> i think that's the only thing I, I don't know mate straight two footer who used to do that tim cahill i oh, used to box it didn't he corner flags go in or i'm going in the crowd one of the yeah. two yeah fair enough right uh before we get started on your career then right let's go back to when you first started playing in goal why goalkeeping uh, my dad was a goalie, like non-league, you know, like back in the day. I think, I don't know what it's called now, like Evo stick or whatever, but he was a goalie. So I used to go and watch him and I was actually an outfield player. Um, went on trial at Ipswich, lad got injured. So I went, I'll go and goal. It's one of them where no technique, just a big kid, just throwing myself in the way. And the scout said to me, he went, you're a goalie. So I didn't know if that was a compliment or, or a negative towards yeah. my outfield stuff. And then, so you'd never played in goal before, but the first game you played was for Ipswich? Yeah, like on a trial game. No way. Um, so from then on, I was eight, so I just went in goal. Um, and that was it. I was I was just hooked after that. Yeah. And then obviously, my dad, he was quite, not tough as in like forceful, like he used to take me out training and, and stuff like that. And we used to work at it quite a lot. And so it was kind of just embedded into me from a really young age. Yeah, that must be a great way to learn, though. Your dad taking you in the back garden down the park, especially with the experience that he had then. Yeah, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but when I was at secondary school, like, I'd be like, I'm not going to school. He's like, right, we'll go out and train then. So he used to come back and we'd do an hour of training or we, leave, we my dad, funny enough, was the caretaker of the school, so he used to come home and um, we lived next to a rugby club, so it's like a 12-minute run around the rugby. And it sounds like it sounds like he's been a really forceful dad, but yeah. it was like one or the other. He's like, if you're going to be at football, you're fully dedicated to it. Um, and I wasn't even in my, I wasn't even my year photo in year 11 <laughs> because I missed it because I went into Lincoln to train and he was like, got no problem with you missing school, but you, you're doing this or you're doing that. It's got to be one or the other. Yeah, you've got to yeah. be fully committed. And whether people think that's right or wrong, um, I really enjoyed it, you know, so um, and kind of put all my eggs in that basket, really. Yeah, so obviously you're saying that you went on trial to Ipswich as an outfielder but signed as a goalie. Did you just go straight into goalkeeper training from that moment on? Yeah. Then? That's crazy. Yeah, so Malcolm Webster, so I went in after that and... I never knew goalkeepers used to have their hands in the set position. Yeah, I was always like, you know, we used to go in low. Dead low, yeah. Um, and stuff like that. So that was like the biggest thing for me to try and get used to that. But I think because I went in at such a young age, um, I adapted quite quickly. Yep. Um, I always had that knack of just getting in the way because I had an older brother and used to have older kids and 
used to get beat up by him or balls <laughs> whacked at me by them anyway. So used to get in the way of footballs. That wasn't a problem. Like the bravery side, it was just then touching upon the technical stuff. Uh, was Obviously, you're saying that you, you play for Ipswich and your dad trained you, but obviously the training and that, you must have just developed so quickly because you hadn't learned any bad techniques anywhere else. It was like straight in, just yeah. go and do what you want to do and dive around. Yeah, I think just that constant repetition. Yeah. And, I, and I say this a lot to the parents when I'm coaching and you might be the same. It's you know, when you come across the kids, I don't think it's necessary that they can't do it. It's just the goalkeeping such unique movements. They've probably never done it. Yep. So I think when they first do it, then they might be able to dive to the right and not to the left. But then after a few weeks or a few months of trying it, they get they get it because yep. it just becomes more natural. Yeah. And I think that's what happened with me. It just, just became the norm. Yeah, yeah. That repetition and just consistency of just doing it over and over. It's just yeah. learn, didn't you? It just becomes yeah. second nature. So from Ipswich, you went to uh, Southwell United, I've got here. Yeah, right? no. yeah, that's where I live still today, yeah. yeah. So obviously you are born in Nottingham, but grew up in Essex. Yeah, my dad's job took us down to, to Essex and back to Nottingham. Um, so and then I just joined my local team Yep. and just tried to just... Actually, when I was, was like a schoolboy at Ipswich, I had the chance to go and finish my contract out of the forest, but they had two goalies already signed on. Yep. Um, and then kind of started secondary school. And it's one of them I found it tough. Do you know what I mean? It's like I need a bit of a break. Like instead of travelling to Chesterfield or to wherever trial and yep. stuff like that, I had a had a little bit of a break and just joined my local team. Oh, nice. But then was you playing with all your old friends and stuff? Or did you obviously yeah, just I was playing my friends, but I was playing a year up. That's how I got scouted because yep. I was just playing in, playing the year up. And you got uh, scouted for Lincoln then? Yeah, yeah. So I went into Lincoln there and it just kind of kicked on from there. Yeah, with your Lincoln one, I was reading through this notes. Right, I'm going to go through some of the loans that you had. Yeah. Because obviously you, you're still a product of their academy, really, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. So you went on loan to Bourne Town, Radcliffe Olympic, Boston Town, Spalding United, Lincoln United, Boston Town, again, and Grantham Town. Yeah. Obviously, as a young pup going into these sort of places, was you nervous? Obviously, it's a lot of different, um, it's a lot of upheaval. Did you know that Lincoln was going to be your, your club or was it always, do I go out and learn more somewhere else? I'll be honest, I never thought I'd be a professional footballer even when I was there. Um, but you know, like the environment back then, like the way pros treated you, or yep. we used to have a thing called a boot room bonanza, where it's like you get locked in the boot room and lights turned off. You can imagine what goes yep. on in there. And if you if you did it, they accepted you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or the wheel of fortune, you cover yourself in boot polish and everything. And so I thought, well, nothing's going to be worse than that. Yep. And then when I went to Radcliffe, mate, my first game for Radcliffe as a 16 year old, the opposition's manager and sorry, at the both managers' wife started fighting. No way. And it got, band- of got abandoned at half time. They were having a full on scrap. So I was like, welcome to men's football. Yep. I thought, well, nothing's going to be worse than that, is no, it? So exactly. It's eye opening. And it? I just really, really wanted to play games. Yep. Like, I just thought it'd be the best thing for me. Um, at whatever level, I just thought if you're playing, you're in someone's eye line, aren't you, really? Yeah. But obviously, t- uh, obviously, going into men's football, 16, 17 year old, and seeing like the boot room stuff and where like the lights would get chucked turned off and every yeah. fo- all the footballs just get chucked at you you get punches swung yeah at you. medicine balls a lot yeah, yeah. everything uh, it obviously football has totally changed for the better now but some of the grounding that you would have learned then would have just hardened you for the for the longevity in your career that you've had yeah like i think it was one of them if you know like you had your own separate jobs didn't you so yeah. if i was on the footballs or so whoever was on the the water bottles if they didn't do the water bottles, that was you was all in. Yeah, it was all punished. Or you know, the amount of times I used to get back to digs, I'd fastly in my hair, and it took me ages to get out of it. Or my arms be aching because we'd have to run up the common hole with a medicine ball and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think I think that makes you stronger. Yeah, yeah, personally. And look, I'm not saying them things should be happening now, but I, f- I do think there is a certain degree where it maybe should still be because I think it makes the relationship between the pros and the youth team a lot closer. It definitely does, In my yeah. opinion. Yeah, like, and you get to know those players more and you look after them a bit more. Like like yesterday, I played for a mixture of the... There's a mixture of the reserves, 18s, 21s in this cup game. I didn't know half of the lads because you don't see them. And I just think it just brings you all a little bit closer. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I've got stories from my youth team and that, but like mine was never... like my. I was just on the change of that because of Arsene Wenger. Yeah. So like mine changed totally. And then when I went up on loan to Scotland, I saw all those sort of antics still going on. It's like, oh my God, this like makes you think I need to get into the first team quick and earn yeah. that respect because then I can not do all that stuff. Yeah, I, I just, I tried to face it full on once and just think, go on then, if, let's have it. Yeah. You know, you got cleaned out of a medicine ball in a dark room and I remember going to pick my bag up once to go back to digs. I couldn't lift it up and it broke my back because the pros had put all the weights in it and stuff like that. <laughs> But um, 
but then they just love me because I like I got on with it and I, yeah. and I faced up to it. I think the lads that don't face up to it or kind of and again whether it's right or wrong, they're the ones that kind of get forgotten about. Yeah. And I always got taught if the pros are talking to you or on you or at you, it means they like you. So yes. I kind of always took it as like a slight compliment anyway. Yeah. Right. Okay. We're gonna go and do a quiz now before we move on to Watford. Okay. Yeah. Huge shout out to Forged Irish Stout for being part of this podcast. Listen to that beauty. An unbelievably smooth, creamy stout by Conor McGregor, the UFC legend. Not here to take part, but here to take over. Forged Irish Stout is on a mission to become the biggest Irish stout. Conor McGregor has taken over the whiskey game. Now he's about to take over the stout game. Me and my guests will be enjoying a few cans in the next few episodes. If you fancy checking it out too, make sure you hit the description below and find out where you can get Forged Irish Stout. Forged Irish Stout will be available in Asda nationwide come August. Let's get back to the podcast. Right, you know all about the quiz. It's a goalie or no goalie. Uh, I've got five current international goalkeepers and five other names from around the world. Uh, you can head over to YouTube still and follow our leaderboard live. Uh, one point for each correct answer. Loads, you know all about this, don't you? You know the stitch ups. Yeah, I'm pretty, nerv- I'm pretty nervous now. Yeah. Yeah. No, you'll be all right. I'm sure you'll do well on this, right? I've got a score scoreboard here. I can now do it myself without any help. <laughs> all right. Uh, number one. Ready? Yeah. Goalie or no goalie? Joel Moore. No goalie. He is a goalie. He is the sight for us goalkeeper and servette. That sounds like such a That's normal not a name. name, is it? That is not a goalie's name. Jo- Joel Moore. I've done you there. I've done you. One nil to me. <laughs> right, number two, moving on. Declan Maloney. No goalie. He is not a goalie. Do you know who that is? Oh, the four brothers. Four brothers. Oh, they're quality, aren't they? Yeah, they're class, mate. So. They are uh, a YouTube sensational. Uh, four brothers that all play golf together, create memes. They're class, mate. They're, I love what they do, to be fair. Are like a golfer? It. No, not really. But I like it when they um, they dress up as the, the, the girls and put the things over their head yeah. as well. The facial expressions that they do are brilliant. <laughs> I went through your Instagram, mate, and seen who you're following. This is yeah. where I got all my oh, okay. story on you. Right, so one out of two. Number three, Rome, Roman Pierce. No goalie. He's not a goalie. He's Tyrese's character from the Fast and Furious. There's about 11 of them now, aren't they? Yeah, I think there actually is, yeah. Still going. Fast and Furious. What a film that used to be when I was a young pup. Now I think, oh my God, what am I watching? Yeah, when the first used to come out and stuff. It's class, like day, yeah. I remember my brother used to have, what was the magazine? Fast Car or whatever. Top Gear? No, no there used to be a magazine yeah. or something. And then my brother had a banged up Nissan Micro, but it had all the stickers and that. Yeah, yeah, and right. it just used to get it from, from there. Fast Car, yeah. yeah that was it, yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Christ, everyone doing their cars up. Yeah, just honestly, stickers on, I remember detailed. he took me and my mate to a party in his Nissan Micro and it had a neon light in the back and honestly I thought I was unreal, mate. <laughs> Get on the back. <laughs> Is it a boom box in the boot Yeah, well? the, Yeah, that was probably bigger than the car. Yeah, no, yeah. it's more expensive too. Yeah. Class. Right, two out of three. Number four, Yindrich Stanic. Goalie. He is a goalie, mate. I'm not saying that name again either. Czech Republic and Pilsen goalkeeper. What my pronunciation he looks hard. I think it used to be Everton. He looks mean, doesn't he? Him? Yeah, he does. Yeah, he looks tough. Right, number five, Anasur Roman. Goalie. He is a goalkeeper, mate. Ben's laughing at my pronunciations again. He is a goalkeeper. He is Bangladesh and Ban Shundarara, King's goalkeeper. I keep turning this the wrong way. You're on three. It's a proper kit. Which yeah. one do you like? The stripy one? That one there with the dots, that's class, isn't it? Like, yeah, it's lively, good. that. Yeah, it's blending for football, isn't it? Yeah. Class. Right, number six, Shubman Gill. No goalie. He is not a goalkeeper. He is Indian batsman, also nice. plays for Gunjarat Titans in IPL. Doing well here, mate. Five out of six. You know what I've been doing on the train, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you, you said <laughs> that you've been researching it. Right, number seven, Georgie Baskan. Goalie. He is a goalie. I just feel like I know that name. Bushcan. 
He is Ukraine and Dinamo Kiev goalkeeper. Heard of him before? I've, I've heard of the second name, yeah. Yeah. Looks a bit like Romero. Yeah, he actually does a little bit. Good shot. Right. Number eight, Timo Armo. Or Al Armu. No goalie. He's not a goalkeeper. He's the founder of uh, Fanbytes. He's actually uh, he's done really well. He uh, works for Nike and Samsung and the UK government. Uh, he's massive. Right. Number nine, Chris Bumstead. Can't be a goalie, surely. No goalie. He is not a goalkeeper. He is Canadian Mr. Olympia, oh, four times winner. Bit of me, that. You follow him. That's yeah. how I know that. It's just because I've got my godfathers of my um, little boy, both not quite like that, but yeah, it's called Seabum, yeah? On yeah, Instagram. That's his name, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what made me think you might yeah. not get it. Yeah. Beast him. That's mental, that, isn't it? Yeah. You're not into all that. No, no, I'm, I'm not into it. If that's like the trainers, that. It fascinates me, but yeah. yeah, you won't get me doing that. I used to have a kit man at Falkirk called Cheb, and he was about five foot tall, and he did it. Really? And like he'd come in and show you the pictures, and he was like proper tiny, a little wee guy, but he was tough as nails. It's like, it's how they eat out of like a Tupperware like yeah. six times a day and don't do anything. Some conditioning you've got to do to be like that, that lifestyle. Right, number 10, last one. You want eight, mate? Fly in here. Kevin Meir. Goalie. He is a goalie. He's Colombia and Athletic and Nacional. Nine out of ten, mate. Fly in there. You've yeah, made right. that look really easy as well. Yeah, I'm a bit of a goalie geek as well. Yeah. I just love Have you just played it down and just went, yeah, I know all my stuff? No, nah, not really. I just love goalkeeping, mate. That's like, I said to my wife the other day, like, I'm really bad at, I can't remember what happened, but I was like, I'm not very good at anything. Yeah. I just like goalkeeping. <laughs> <laughs> can't put can't put a picture up on the wall or anything like that, but anything goalkeeping, I'm all over it. It's mad. I have these conversations at football, but like I'm the same. So like I'll, I'll know like the f top three goalkeepers from every team in the UK. Like and like someone will say a name and I'm like, oh they're, oh, they're there. And they're like, how do you know that they've moved to the, and you're like, I just it's the best thing in the world, mate, I think. Yeah, it's like our own little sport yeah, it within the that's sport. What, but that's our little community is the goalkeeping. Nine out of 10, mate. Congratulations. Buzzing with that. I was just trying to explain, I like my mate, I was on about earlier, Nicky Featherston, he might have played against me a few times. He's like, I hate goalies. Yeah. And like, you never, like, it's like, you, it's like, why can goalie, goalies do outfield coaching, but if an outfield coach did goalie training or whatever, not allowed, and like, it just doesn't happen. It's it just not work. a rule, but um, they just don't get it, do they? No, they don't. But uh, again, it is a weird one that we have to do the outfield coaching. Yeah. You should be able to specialise in your own. Field. I do get it to for the playing out to, kind to of learn stuff the game a bit. General knowledge, but they should have to do ours, then, shouldn't they? I think that when you do your pro, you have to do a, a little bit. I think I think you actually do cover a little bit yeah, on your you B do, as yeah. well, your outfield as well. So that's why they hate us. That's why all managers hate goalies because they have to learn about us. And there's some written rule that any shot from 25 yards can't go in. Yeah, it's not allowed to. Can't get beaten from there. No. Right. Okay. If, I want to go straight to Watford then. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you had a really successful period there. You moved, They bought you for 50 grand from Lincoln uh, and you signing pro. Must have been nice to move back down to Essex. Yeah, well, I ended up staying. I was in digs. I got put in. Oh, did you? Yeah, I got put in with a really, really nice family. Um, and they just made it feel like home. Yeah. And it was a strange one at first because they had three kids. And you know, when you go into digs, you're like, I've got to my room. Like, if I'd, if I'd come in from training, no one was in and I was watching telly in the living room, they would just be like, oh, no, you stay in there. We'll go and they just left it to me like my own house and it yep. really helped me settle in and I think that was a massive thing because when I first went down to Watford it was like March of that season stayed there obviously got promoted to the Premier League yep. and then we had like 10 weeks off so I went home and it was almost like the worst thing that happened to me because it was like I've got to go back again Yep. And, and going back really really helped me settle in yeah and you had a couple of loans there that uh, benefited you massively didn't you yeah um, went to Stafford uh, Rangers they were in the conference at the time and then or National League as it is now yep but then went to Bradford for half the season there, which was incredible, really, for 19, playing at that stadium. And, yep. you know, I owe Stuart McCall a lot. He just, he said, no, you're coming in, because I had Donovan Ricketts at the time. Yep. And he was supposed to move, but it fell through. Oh, right, okay. And after a week of being there, he called me saying, bad news, Donovan's not gone. He said, but you're my goalie. After a week, he said, brought you in, playing you. And then, funny enough, we played in pre-season, is it Sheffield, isn't he? Yeah. And he come and grabbed me, put his out, and he was like, you owe me for your career. I was like, <laughs> the map. I was like yeah, I know. 
but yeah, no, it was a um, really, really good, good loan move. Really enjoyed it. So when someone puts their arm around you and gives you that belief, saying, look, you're going to play, just go out and enjoy yourself, go and do what you do, it, you just go out with like that added, uh, added bit of like shoulders pumped up, didn't you? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's massive, especially with goalie, because you're going to let goals in, you're going to yeah. make mistakes, it's part of the job. But if, if you're looking around thinking, I've got a, another number one breathing down my neck and you're thinking, does he think I've got to be in or whatever? You need that run of games. And I think just that support system helps you get that consistency. Yeah, and then going back to Watford, you ended up getting in the team and making your debut with the, the can we talk about the ghost goal? Yeah, yeah. So you hadn't let a goal in until the ghost goal. Uh, can you explain what this is? Obviously, we've all, um, most of us have seen it. Yeah, those sort of watching can type it on YouTube and Mark Poom, like, he was incredible, mate. Honestly, like the most, profe I think that's where I got a lot of my professionalism from. He was the, most workaholic I've ever met. Come out for a header, land on his collarbone. Collarbone was gone. I think Richard Lee was injured at the time. Um, so I came straight on. I was on the first goal kick, mate. I probably reached the edge of my box, you know, from nervous <laughs> about kicking the floor. And then one of them in, you know, one of them in swinging crosses. They misses everyone, so I just don't react. I had to tip it over. And then from that corner, obviously it was a bit of a melee. They've hit the bar, gone out, gone out for a goal kick. I've put the ball down, which you can see on the video. And the ref's like giving a goal. And we're all like, not got a clue yeah. how it's happened. And and I was just like, well, welcome to the championship, like six minutes into my debut or whatever. And that's how it all started. So the ball went wide, didn't it? But didn't even go wide. Their player hooked it back in. Oh, right. Okay. So they've had a header. I think Noel Hunt maybe or someone's. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. Um, you'll see. I think their own player tries to keep it in. Yeah. And the lines could be there. Like, oh, my God. Young <laughs> pup there. Look like 11 off Stranger Things. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's... Um, I'm sure it's Noel Hunt who tries to keep it back in. But yeah. No, that's not it after that. Yeah, so obviously... Here it is. Here it is. This one here, that one there, that's where the linesman said it went in. And it's when there. he's hooked it from beyond the post. And our argument with the ref was, but you're in the box, you can see it. Yeah. And then what really wound me up, watch Stephen Hunt's reaction when he goes to the linesman, he runs off like celebrating. Does like, he? Yeah. Just like, Takes it as if I it's I saw him gone. years later at Ipswich, it was like... But I get on really well with him. He's a great guy. But just um, that's what I mean. No one, no one has a clue. Yeah. So the ball obviously is has been headed and it's gone wide. And then Stephen Hunt's hooked it back in yeah, from going think, wide. Yeah, one of the two. And then uh, you've then made a really good save off the header. Yeah, just, just flinging myself around like. And the refs actually given a goal. They're here. They're yeah. paused. That's what it's give it for there. And then. Um, the refs actually give it because your players appealed for the corner. So you know, like now when you're watching the prem. And it's like Stuart Atwell's doing very yeah. well. I'm like getting angry at the turn. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, you I'm never like, had that. Like, he's going to mess up him. He's and that was the first goal you let in for Watford as yeah. well. That's yeah. crazy, that. It's yeah. horrible. Yeah, so that's a great trivia question there for some Yeah, it is yeah. really, yeah. yeah. Right, so you end up going to play over, over 150, 160 games yeah. for Watford. You obviously had a really successful period. Did, was you, did you go back into the team from Watford because of how confident you was from your loan move? Yeah, I went back from Bradford and went to Eddie Bruford. I played every game pre-season. Yeah. I did really, really well. And then he pulled me the day before we were playing Crystal Palace at home. And he said, I can't play yet. I've got a bit of experience. Um, and I, I remember this session to the day, like, you know, when you do set pieces, you're the position. I was coming and catching everything because I was like quite wound up. Uh, but I totally got the decision. Yeah. And I just think I've been kind of highlighted to so much men's football from being at Lincoln in that change room to... Yeah. So that was just kind of still on that kind of crest of the wave, still on that adrenaline rush and ready for it. So yeah. I think when I got in, and we were quite lucky, we had quite a young team, um, like Adrian Mariapa, yes. and obviously when I got in, Brendan Rodgers took the job, so like you had Liam Bridcut, Tom Cleverley, Jack Court. So we had quite a young team, so it was almost like just playing with your mates, really. Yeah. And I think that made it easier as well. That must have been a really good environment and dressing room to be in then, because you'd all been young pups almost, but making a, a name for yourself and... Like you said, there were some really experienced ones in yeah. there too that would have guided you. Like John Eustace was the glue that held it together. Yeah. He was incredible. Like, what a captain and what a guy. Like, he could flick from being like the cool young kid, like someone's dad, to then being like the experienced pro and let you know. And, and I think I think he made that dressing room what yeah. it was personally. Yeah. I think he got that balance really, really well. Yeah. Uh, really right. And then you moved back to your boyhood club, uh, Ipswich. We talked obviously uh, before the show as well that you. He was kind of a Man United fan, but obviously growing up down that way. Yeah, so obviously that class of 92 and that everyone loved it, didn't they, yeah. growing up? And it's like Man City now, isn't it? Like, my lad loves City just because of how successful they are. And I was the same with Man U. And, but my dad used to take me to watch Chips, which on a Friday night when George Burley was the manager. And 
just kind of the first team I fell in love with and, and watching watching them live really. Yeah. Um, so to go back there was was a great opportunity for me just to kind of tick something off the bucket list. Yeah. And to be honest, I found the move really hard when I got there because, like I just said, you know, when you're in that dressing room full of young kids, yeah. I went into the Ipswich dressing room. It was like, right, go be a man. And I'll be honest, I struggled a little bit. Yeah, I yeah. found it really difficult. Um, did well the first couple of games. Saved a penalty at Portman Road, which is something I'll remember. And um, was really, and then, then kind of hit a brick wall and just found it difficult. Right. Um, okay. And then had a bit of a spell out of the team. And then I got back in and I was fine after that. But that, that initial first month of settling in was like a bit, a bit of a culture shock for me. Yeah. What do you reckon the catalyst was f- for that? I'm not really sure. I don't know if it was a different environment or... Or what, or just being around, maybe the, de- the demand or the expectation. I think at yep. Watford, bef- this was before they got taken over, so the expectation was almost always to stay up or be mid-table because yep. they went into administration nearly a couple of times I was there. Whereas Ipswich, uh, Chopra, Bullard, who were great, by the way, great yep. people, uh, big wage bills, big expectations, and I'm just not sure. Not wasn't ready for that. I'd just never been exposed to that. So yep. it was kind of like, well, you've got to really be at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The pressure of fighting in a relegation battle is so different and the pressure of fighting for a promotion. They're two total different things, aren't yeah. they? Do you think like, that played a part then that you're saying? Yeah, I think so. I think um, just the experience of the lads in there as well, like some of the names, are just, they, they were, they've had them careers because they're winners, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so every little fine detail, like, of, of course you've got to be at it every day in training, but it was the first time I'd really experienced not having my mates to kind of lean on. Do you know what yep. I mean? Being just just being out your comfort zone, I think it was. Yep. Uh, and then you moved up to to Rotherham, and uh, you had a couple of loans while you was there as well. You, you you've had a lot of loans. Yeah, haven't you? I was really really just wanting to play. Yes. I think looking back on it, you could think right, just stay in that kind of setup and be one of them championship goalies where you're a two, maybe a three, yep. play the odd game, be a one. But I just really wanted to play. And Rotherham for me was the wrong move. It was the wrong fit. I was more like a rabbit in the headlights because I was getting married, moving back up north to where my wife's from and stuff like that and just didn't work out. Um, obviously, I think everyone knows what Steve Evans is like anyway. <laughs> um, don't get me wrong, he's, he's what he is, but just just didn't take to him. I just couldn't hunt. I could be honest, I like, just couldn't hunt. I like, just found it really bizarre yep. on a daily basis. And, um, and then Jimmy Walker actually and Darren Ferguson rang me at Peterborough and just said, look, don't, don't care what's gone off anywhere. Don't care whatever. We remember you from this. Come and play for us. And just again, like filled me with so much confidence. And Ben Alec was injured. Yeah. Uh, and I think Ben actually told him to get me in as well. So massive credit to Ben. That's class. Uh, went in for a month and honestly loved it. Yeah. Jimmy's cl- would have oh, been class to work with. I'm it? trying to get him down to my um, my goalies because actually coach his nephew. Yeah. But oh, what a guy, mate. Yeah, I met old Jimmy in the summer. Oh, he's an incredible, mate. And what I really liked about him, if you you know when you're going to do your set, if you if you did a really good set, but right, get out, get out, like you know, always kept you on a good high and yeah. stuff like that. And I think again, you know, like we said about coaches playing and not, he knew exactly what you needed and what you wanted. Um, he was really good, and we played against Jovel for Peterborough, and then they decided to take me when Jed still went back. So, yep. so yeah, I did get a good run of games, albeit not for Rotherham, but yep. it kept me ticking over. Uh, you've chased games most of your career. That's, you, that was part of my problem. I think, yep. Yeah, I, I, I'm exactly the same in that sort of mentality. That if I wasn't playing, I was like, I need to go and play. Like, if and ha- what's my opportunity? Is it a loan? Is it a permanent move? I'll just work my way to get more games somewhere yeah I think that's why I went to Notts really um, obviously being at home and I've, I've heard a few people talk about him about Kevin Pilkington like class like honestly was he really really he's good, a good yeah he's a good friend of mine as well and I think um, there's only him and there's a, I've had a lot of good coaches yep. but Pilks and a, and a guy at Chesterfield I'm sure we'll touch on in a minute they really understood me like as a person yep. and Pilks knew exactly what I needed and when I needed it um, he would even come and meet me in the mornings to do gyms or or invite me over in the summer to his to do stuff and keep me ticking over. Like, yeah. really looked after me and yeah. um, got nothing but good stuff to say about him. And he was part of the reason I went to Knotts. And Roy Carroll was on his way out. Yeah. So I thought, uh, and uh, true to his words, like, you're going to get in. Roy's on his way out. I got in, had a really, really good season. And then, but because I'd never experienced like League Two before, yeah. what I didn't realise at that level, when managers swap and change all the time, they bring their own people in, don't they? Yeah. So John Sheridan came in and brought in 11 new players. And then the day before the transfer, he was like, "You can go out on loan." If you, so I was just never going to play. Yeah. So it kind of, kind of killed the momentum a little bit. Give, gives you no time as well to find a new club. No. So I was kind of on the bench in League Two, and you're thinking, "God, I've been from here to there," and I think that all just comes from chasing the games. And that was why. That's why I went to Hartlepool because I thought, right, I need to just strip this back, start again at a half decent club, yep. and show everyone I'm still here, still around, I can still play, 
and probably went on to have the best two years, I think, playing-wise. Yeah, I've you, had you won a lot of awards while you was there as well. Players' Player of the Year, Manager's Player of the Year, Fans' yeah, Player of the Year. Lo- loved it, mate. I loved every single thing about it. Um, my best friend in football, I've touched on earlier, Nicky, and I like with Jake Cassidy. We had a car school. We're still in touch every single day to this day. Yeah. I mean, you can't can't reveal the content of what goes on the group <laughs> chat, but like we're really close, and you don't really get that too much in football. Do you? Yeah. Like you kind of lose touch, but we're at each other every day, and th- them two made the travelling really enjoyable, and the fans really took to me, and just, I just enjoyed everything about the club and my time there. Yeah, yeah. And, and that kind of made me kind of not put myself back on the map, but show everyone that I'm, I can still play, I'm still capable, um, and I just wanted to play games. But that I always think that it goes back to being, you know you're the number one, you know you're going to yeah. play. So you've got like a, an air of confidence. It's not arrogance, but it's confidence that you know, look, no matter what I do today, I'm not under pressure. If I make one mistake, I could be out. There's someone breathing down my neck. But in that same sense, it, it makes you feel more, I don't know, comfortable in your goal. Yeah, and it, and it brought me on as a character as well. Um, it made me be, I wouldn't say a leader as in like ranting and raving, but I felt like I was one of the dressing room lads could talk to or, or feed on and, and stuff like that. And but I think that was to, to do with the environment and, and everything I was putting at the time. Yeah. I think it helped me develop as a person as well, which has put me in this position to, to where I am now. Yep. What are you like in a dressing room? Are you a talker or are you just um, get not, around each individual? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not like a ranter and raver. Yeah. Like I, w- I will talk to anyone. Yeah. About anything. Yeah. Um, I'll have a laugh with anyone about anything, and I just try and be a good person. Yeah. I'm not yeah. someone who's like everyone's mate. Do you know what I mean? But like I know my place. If you know what I mean. Yeah. But you know, if someone wants to have a laugh, I'll have a laugh. If someone, if a young lad needs to speak to me about something or whatever, or even at, even at um, Barbie now, like Conor Hurahan, believe it or not, like he's he loves coaching as well and knows everything about football. So I'll go and chew his ear off about, and he'll have a really good chat with me about goalies and stuff because yeah. he's he worked with Cutler. And so whether it's a serious chat or a rubbish chat, or I'm doing gym with David McGoldrick or something, I just I'm there to kind of at this moment try and hope hopefully make the environment better yeah but yeah. I know my role if that makes yeah, sense yeah no exactly that I think it's about knowing the personalities in a dressing room but I won't force anything I'm yeah not, yeah because I can't change who I am like no. I had a manager who wanted me to be well Nick McCarthy great guy um, but he was like need you to be more angry more lively but I'm like that's not me as a person so mm. I felt if I did that, everyone would think I was a bit of a whopper because it just looked out of character. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And then yeah. obviously it's quite a big move back down south, Hartlepool to Barnet. Yeah. Again, just just games. And um, I think I was talking to producer about South End. Darren Curry was my, um, the reason I went down there. Like, again, just a really good guy I got on with. Um, if I needed a few days off to stop me travelling, he, he, would, he would do that. And again, we had a really good team. Some of the lads have gone like, Jack Taylor's gone on to Peterborough and uh, Ipswich now, sorry, and Ricardo Santos at Bolton. We just had a good squad and it just felt like the right fit at the time. Yeah, and you end up playing a lot of games. I know you, you've played... So I, I, when I was looking through it, your last two years at Hartlepool, you played 50 games a season yeah. for both seasons. Then at Barnet, you played 72 games over two years. And then you went to Chesterfield and you played every game that season. Yeah. So it seems like the, the back end of your career, you just you knew your body, you knew yeah. you was comfortable, you knew you'd be playing... And obviously, you got the best out of your body and uh, you was playing your best, probably. Yeah, a lot of that comes, like I said, down to the environment. I enjoyed all three and I touched on the, the Chesterfield goal and coach a minute ago. Uh, David O'Hare, his name is. He would, even if I wanted to train, and he'd be like, no, you're not training. Yeah. And I'd be like, yeah, he'd be like, no, you're not. And he'd, he'd always get a bit angry with me and, and then I'd go away mad. But then I'd come back an hour later and like, yeah, you're right. He just really knew me inside yeah. out. And I think I was something like the first goalie in, since Tommy Lee or somebody to play all the games at Chesterfield. So I was proud of that. That's brilliant. That, yeah. um, that achievement to play every single game. And again, I think it's down to the people that look after you. And I think with a goalie coach as well, it's that trust that I had to trust what he was saying was right. Um, and, and, he, and he was. And I think that's, that is ultimately the reason why I played every single game. Yeah, you've clearly taken a lot throughout your career from different people, different coaches and stuff. Uh, is there one that had the biggest effect? Or is it just a catalyst of a load of people? Yeah, like, so Alex Chamberlain at Watford, he was like a dad because I was young. Yeah. Ross Turnbull, when I had him at Hartlepool, he did stuff that I never even knew existed because Czech used to do it. Like, yeah. everything involved thinking about something. And then I've got to say, like, Pilks and um, David uh, David O'Hare at Chesterfield, the mental side and, and how they were as a person to me. But then, strip that all back. Andy Warrington now is just about, like, work hard, keep the ball out of the net, 
look after you, like he looks after us three and us three only. Yep. And if like yeah, that's all it needs to be, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. I'm just trying to take little bits of each one, and hopefully put my personality on it as well. Yeah. Because I just get really excited when we train. Yeah. You know, if a kid makes a save, I'll like, celebrate or whatever. And if I can add them bits into it as well, then hopefully it will it'll take me further as well. Yeah, you're clearly enjoying your time oh, at Derby as well. Yeah, honestly, I love it. I think like I've, I've touched on Joe a few times. He's someone that I just want the best for. Like yep. he's the most humble goalkeeper I think I've worked with. And Joshy, to be fair, Joshy's yep. come in and. Um, they kind of get what I'm doing. I mean, they batter me and call me old and Asian and all this and <laughs> I get all, all that. But, but, as well. but I'll take it. I, I feel like they like having me around and um, they've been great. So even if Woggy's had an injury and they let me take a session or try something out on them, they really buy into it and they mm. give it their all. Um, even Luke McGee, who was there last year, yeah. what a guy, mate, honestly. <laughs> I've been blessed with the goalies I've worked at there. And I think some of the young kids I get to work at, work with, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the names because they're below 16, but there's three exceptional talents yeah. that if they don't play for England, then between between us all, I think we've probably failed. If they don't play at some level for yeah. England, that is because... Of know. course, yeah, it's difficult. And then I've got to mention that the head of academy, Ross Atkins, he's been unbelievable with me. Like, And when I joined in his session with the 23s, I pick up ideas off him because he's very good at accommodating big numbers. Yep. So I had to do a crossing session with him the other day when we did when the other lads played an in-house game and I come off blowing but you know because he kept everyone so active all the time yeah the way he can switch from first team lads to nine year olds it's like incredible never seen anything like it yep. so just trying to build on that really right let's uh, get onto your gloves and that then this is Matt Smith and this is the glove review on the yours mine away podcast talked a lot about your, your career and stuff right what gloves are you wearing now uh, I'm wearing these position ones um, pretty pretty simple I just love a thick glove. Yep. Love a, love a good feel of a glove on my hand. Sometimes I wear finger savers, depends on how I feel. I still wear finger yeah, savers. Yeah, it must be a generational thing, Yeah, it must right? be. Um, they looked after me when I was younger, when I was with Dave Sanderson, I mentioned to you earlier, but he left, so I kind of lost touch. And yeah. then um, a lady called Lena has been in touch and kind of got back in because they're throwing stuff at the, sc- at the goalie school. And yeah, just a really great opportunity to wear them. And I'm pretty simple when it comes to the gloves. If I like the feel of them, yep. as long as they're thick, I'm, I'm pretty happy. Yeah, you like thick gloves then? Yeah. 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 Um, Never really wore roll finger. I, yeah. I wore a hybrid quite a lot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just again, not not really too fussed. It's yeah. just something about roll finger. I feel like they split maybe. Uh, whether that's just me thinking that myself, but I feel like you know the stitching on the palm. Yeah. And I don't quite get that feel. Uh, what size are you? I'm a ten in them, but they're yeah. quite big. I, I fluctuate from a nine to a ten depending on what. Have you have you changed the type of gloves now that obviously for training more than playing? Because obviously it's two total different things, and people. Obviously, you ask us a lot of questions, but like match gloves, you keep as match gloves. Yeah, and yeah. obviously, training gloves are you batter them and they don't really matter the condition because it makes you uh, concentrate more and take care of things more in training. If, if I was to play tomorrow, I'd have to wear a new pair. Yeah. I'd have to get them out the night before, wear them for a few volleys, shower, make sure they're clean. And if I had a run of games, like you said, I wouldn't touch them ones till, till they're a game. Yeah. But they'd have to be almost pristine, just a psychological thing. Yeah. But training, I wear them for. As long as I can and wipe the Vaseline on him or, or do whatever, do you know what I mean? It's you are a Vaseline goalie, oh, yeah. yeah. Not on a Friday, though. Not that I'm banned on a Friday. The, the last it ruins everyone else's Yeah, the lads don't like it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have to... How good is it in the wet? People don't understand how good it is. I know. I was saying it to the uh, the parents. That's like, look, if you've got an old pair of gloves and you don't want to... Just, if it's wet, put Vaseline on them. Yep. And honestly, you, you'll get you'll get a good few more weeks out of them. Yeah, people are baffled by this. I've done this. Yeah. It's an old school thing, I think. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure who thought of it or how it came across, but... I really enjoy it, and the lads can feel it. You know, yeah, lads yeah. serving like who's got Vaseline on. Yeah. So I try, I try not to in training as much as I can. Yeah, especially on a Friday when it, like, you're ruining other people's matches. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, but like yesterday, obviously playing that game and the weather was horrendous, and I thought I'm just go, just just going Vaseline, but it's so safer. tacky, isn't it? Yeah. That noise just just feels a bit safer, I think. Yeah, it does. Yeah, nice. Right. Uh, you got any superstitions when you play? Not really. Uh, I have to. I touch the bar. I've got. My body's covered in tattoos. I touch the bar, I touch all my kids' names yeah. before the kickoff and the second half. And if we score, we touch the bar. But apart from that, yeah. like, I don't know if that's a superstition. It's like a or... reset button, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, like pretty much like that. It's not not really any superstitions as such. Yeah, uh, are you big on uh, like the goalkeeper's diet being so different to outfielders? Um, mate, I'm not big. Yet. I just love coffee, mate. Yeah, like, whether <laughs> that's, that's a goalie. That's a proper goalie yeah. thing. That. But yeah, I think. Yeah, I think as long as you. See, I don't drink during training. It makes me feel sick. Oh, right. So even like 
obviously when I was in Spain in the summer, like I pour it over me whenever the old swag, but I hate drinking during training because I feel like heavy or feel yeah. a bit uncomfortable. So I think it's whatever makes you feel sports better. Sports scientist must be killing you then. Yeah, well, I had an argument with sports scientist once because she was like, you should do this, this and this. And I was like, I've had a Red Bull and wine gums before every game for the last 20 years. It's not done me any harm. Yeah. And she was like, just back and forth. I think it's just how you feel, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly it. Like everybody over the whole career will develop their own little habits or how they like feeling. Like on a match day, I like to feel quite empty. Yeah. Like, And I'm, I'm like, I'll just load up on a bit of coffee and stuff like that and a bit of caffeine and... I'm I'm good to go. Yeah, that way. The, the lighter I feel, the better. Yeah, and then kind of I'll get that hour or two out of the rest of the game. Then I'll kind of stop back up then. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy me Saturday night, but yeah, before a game or during the week, I have to feel as light as I possibly can. Yeah, All right. I I need to talk about your international career before okay. we finish. Yeah, uh, you knew I'd bring this up, didn't you? Uh, I had a feeling you would. Right. Uh, obviously, uh, you played for you played uh, a lot of the younger age groups and that, and then you played in uh, for the under twenty ones in the Euro final against Germany. Uh, came in for Joe Hart as he got uh, suspended. That must have been a most surreal, nerve-wracking moment. Yeah, do you know what? I probably had the worst game I've ever had. I, was, I wasn't great. Um, just didn't go right for me um, on the night. But I remember getting off the pitch. Just I swapped shirts with Neuer. <laughs> and I was like, at the time... It's it just I, mental. The only reason I got his shirt was because he used to play with Schalke on FIFA and he was yeah. unreal. Um <laughs> How good was he at Schalke oh, as well? Like, he'd, feel, he'd feel that door frame, and I just remember watching him in the because we played him in the group as well, yeah. and actually got to play. Me and Joe Lewis split the game because yeah. we'd already qualified. Stuart Pierce, like you're both playing half, and I remember watching him in the warm ups. I said, "How could someone so big be so like agile and yeah. athletic?" And so, like in terms of you know when you go back to your favourite goalie, I just love love him yeah. modern day. Um, so obviously that was surreal. I remember talking to the chairman afterwards, and, and he said, "Look." It doesn't matter what's happened. You've played in a big game here, and it actually had a good effect on me because I went and got player of the year at Watford. Well, young player of the year after that, and yeah. went to get more caps. So, probably toughened me up a little bit. That goalkeeping community, Joe Hart, Joe Lewis, and you, yeah. some standard of goalie. Joe Hart's an animal, isn't he? Yeah, but yeah. It just I've was, never, was he just he... used to get better and better towards the game. So, like, it's not yeah. often next day be another step better and another step better and. Just a physical... People don't know how big he is, do they? He's a mentality monster as oh, well, right. isn't he? And he's massive. Yeah. yeah, he's got big forearms and... Throws weights around. Like massive neck nothing. and back. Yeah, he's just, yeah, yeah, oh, he's got just, a big neck. Uh, Joe Lewis, honestly, what a guy, mate. What a yeah. character. Just, yeah, I loved him. Um, and again, thought he was a really, really good goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then obviously the the season after, he was with the 21s but call, got called up yeah. to, to go with the first team because there was a few injuries with the senior team. That must have been really surreal. Yeah, it was... I remember... Malky Mackay ringing me um, and telling me. And I was just like, Phew. and then we actually had older shot for Watford in the cup. He said, you're going after this. So I didn't play when Eagle Martin played. And then I'd go straight to um, the Grove, is it? The, the Grove, yeah. So everyone was in bed, they get to meet everyone. So the first thing I have to do in the morning is walk down to breakfast and you've got like Gerard, Lampard. And I was quite lucky because a lot of the 21s had been pushed up. Yep. And I remember sitting there at breakfast and I've, I've told the story before and I'm sat down with Joe Hart, Gary Cahill and Stephen Gerrard. And I just kept telling myself, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave, because this might never happen again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Joe was like, right, I'm off. I thought, don't leave, don't leave. And then Gary Cahill was like, right, see, and I was like, don't leave. And to be fair, mate, Stephen Joe, he spoke to me about football, knew everything. And I just walked back to my room, just like, felt like a million dollars. And What an experience that is. But yeah, it was surreal, mate. Like, even, like, Capello didn't used to do team talks. It was, or we'd have team meetings, and he'd call out, he'd be like, Wayne Rooney, you do this. I call him by the name, but then all his Italians would be in the background just talking. And I was like, this can't be normal. And then before the game, he would not really say much. And after the game, he, he wouldn't really say anything. I was like, this is weird. And yeah, the whole thing was just surreal. Obviously, Fozzie was in the squad at the time. Yeah. And I remember we played France and the kit man walked in with all the, all the shirts and just threw them on the floor. And Fozzie picked up Lloris and went, there you go. For it. And I was just like, oh, this is unreal. Like, That's class. So like... And to be fair, he got me checks as well at Watford, so yeah. I, I own quite a lot for my collection. But um, yeah, just real surreal moments, mate. What was the standard like? Oh, just waving at shots, mate. <laughs> yeah, they, they, I wanted to know about this because obviously they don't, they don't, they don't hit it though. They just place everything. Just plot, but it's still so powerful. It's like their groins are not human. And do you know what I thought? I thought if I don't die for everything, you've yeah. got all these people in Wembley, you've got Ray Clements and all the other lads thinking he's rubbish. Obviously, I was thinking, I've got so mate. I went in after the warm up. Honestly, I was knackered, blowing, yeah, absolutely blowing, and didn't get near any shots whatsoever. Yeah, and then you got Lampard in his wobblers and stuff, and you're just like, just a completely 
it did make me think, you know, when people watch Match of the Day or watch Telly, like, got to save us. Like, you ain't got a clue. Yeah, yeah. They ain't got a clue. What the power like. of some of their lads as well, when you're actually yeah. diving after it and it's already hitting the net. Well, I remember I remember one in training, like, Joe had his back to goal. So I can't remember, someone played it into him. And it was against Harty. He didn't even look at it. He just turned and swiveled and just, and you're thinking, like, have you even done that? Yeah, yeah. And someone of Joe's couldn't, couldn't get near it. So it's like, phenomenal, really. Yeah. And the goalie coach, mate, I don't know if Fozzy, he was just... Who was the goal coach at the time? Some Italian geezer. Oh, was and it? Then, but Clem was there kind of shadowing yep. him. and like It was all like sets of one, like picking the ball up. And if we did crossing, like, you know, shout away. Yeah. He'd be like, no, you dive out and you punch it like this. I was like, obviously not seeing me play, mate. I ain't doing that. <laughs> but um, yeah, just the whole thing was surreal. And it's not something I really think about. I think it's not... It's a hell like, of an achievement, mate. I don't yeah, think you're giving yourself I've, enough credit I've got for a mate it. I know for a fact will be watching this and hammering me because like you don't talk about it but you should yeah, yeah well, I don't, I, I I've been really, telling everyone I don't really I don't know I just did something I'm quite I'm quite chilled yeah. maybe I'll look back at it in a few years when I, when I fully finish but yeah but again it's all experiences hopefully I can take and, and pass on yeah no exactly mate to be called up twice to the yeah. senior camp is just mental yeah and yeah yeah, yeah. I don't know it just it still hasn't really sunk in I don't think no all right. Well, you've had an, uh, an unbelievable career, mate. You, you've amassed some amount of games. You're still going as well, by the yeah, way. Yeah, still off over, no. Like, I'm glad you're not. No, nah, definitely not. Right. Uh, I've got one final question. That I always end on now. Uh, what does the goalkeepers' union mean to you? Oh, everything. I think the biggest thing is trust and a bit of loyalty and knowing your role. I think, like I said, I'm really lucky with what we've got. Um, and hopefully, when I'm a coach or if I become a coach, that. I can put these beliefs on. I think knowing your role is massive. Yep. And knowing that you're there to support the number one and, and the number two and the two is there to fight the one and you, and you all know exactly what you're doing and I think as long as you trust each other and buy into it because you know on a wet, windy morning in December when you might have had a beast on a Saturday, you, it's you lot in the corner and yep. it's sticking together and it's almost like you lot against the world and you've got to save this and I just think for me, I touched on it earlier, it's our own sport within a sport I think it's just it is just that trust and togetherness to kind of battle on together through the season. I think. Yeah, you you've got a, a really nice demeanour about how you love goalkeepers as well. By the way, like oh. proper love the sport that we do. Oh, mate, the goal is never at fault, are they? Yeah, it's, it's got to get through ten of the players. Goal is just at the top top V for. I I honestly the amount of people that mess with like see that you see that I'm like, you ain't got a clue. Like honestly, you ain't got a clue yeah. what it's what it's like to be there. But I will fight a goalie until. I'm blue in the face, mate, and, and, that, and that is it. And that's how it'll always be. No, it's been a great episode, mate. Uh, thank you very much for coming no, on no, and telling me your story it. and that, mate. It's been really good. No, I've loved every second of it, mate. Oh, thank thank you. you very much. Right. Cheers. I need to say a massive shout out to our two sponsors, uh, Mito Red Light and uh, Forge Irish Stout for helping us with the pod. Uh, they really do help us grow behind the scenes. This has been the Yours Mine Away podcast with me, Mark Howard. Make sure you give us a subscribe and a like. Uh, it really does help. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Scotty. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Save from Mark Howard.